Please welcome the Claire Tao Professor of Political Science at Barnard College, Alexander Cooley, and the leader of Belarusian Democratic Forces, Ms. Svetlana Tikhonovskaya. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Alexander Cooley. I'm a professor of political science and vice provost at Barnard College, and I previously served as the 15th director of the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. It is my enormous pleasure to welcome you to today's World Leaders Forum here in Lowe Library uh, with uh, Madam Svetlana Tikhonovskaya. Uh, we are here in Lowe Library, but we are also being broadcast on live stream over the YouTube channel of Columbia University and the World Leaders Forum. So welcome to you all in person and remotely. I would like to begin by acknowledging the co-sponsors of this event, Columbia Center on Global Economic Governance at the School of International and Public Affairs, as well as the Harriman Institute for the Study of Russia, Eurasia, and Eastern Europe. I am honored to introduce Madam Svetlana Tukhonovskaya, leader of Democratic Belarus. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. She is truly an inspirational figure. In August of 2020, she ran for president against Belarus's longtime autocratic leader, Alexander Lukashenko, who dismissed her at the time as a non-threatening political amateur. But Madam Tukhonovskaya surprised her country and the world by joining forces with other leaders and uniting democratic forces in Belarus and amassing tremendous public support. Although official election results claimed a victory for Mr. Lukashenko, the election was widely considered fraudulent by independent observers. The European Union issued a statement that the 2020, quote, Belarus presidential elections were neither free nor fair and that the European Union does not recognize their falsified results. It went on to say that the so-called inauguration of the 23rd of September 2020 and the new mandate claimed by Alexander Lukashenko lack any democratic legitimacy. Instead of becoming the country's democratically elected president, a result that many believe a legitimate count of the votes would have reflected, Madame Tronovskaya was forced to flee her country. Her forced exile ignited an unprecedented wave of peaceful protests across Belarus, and as a result, she has become an iconic figure and symbol of freedom and democratic solidarity around the world. She never aspired to become a political figure, certainly not a revolutionary one. She was born in a granite mining town in southern Belarus just three years before the Chernobyl disaster occurred in neighboring Ukraine. Thanks to one of the children's charities set up to take children out of areas affected by the disaster, she spent several summers in Ireland. She later studied to be an English teacher, but after giving birth to a hearing impaired son, she gave up her career to care for him and devote herself to his education. It was Madame Tuhanovskaya's husband, opposition journalist Sergei, who first entered politics. He registered to run against Mr. Lukashenko in 2020, but was quickly arrested, and he remains a political prisoner to this day. To protest the injustice of her husband's arrest and the lack of democratic freedom in Belarus, Madame Tukhonovskaya registered herself as a presidential candidate and began the campaign that continues to this very day. She has proven to be a dynamic orator and a courageous force for free expression and democratic reform. Her remarks today are on how a free Belarus will promote democracy in Ukraine and security for Europe. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Professor Kuli, for such um, detailed introduction. Uh, dear friends, thank you for inviting me today. Uh, I'm really pleased and honored to be here. Thank you to the Herman Institute's leadership and Professor Fry for hosting the conversation and the many students, of course, who are joining us today. I must say that I'm really jealous of you. 
and uh, I perhaps one day uh, when I will finish my accidental political career, I will come back to study in this university, who knows, or at least I will come here with my two kids and my husband, Sergei, who was sentenced to 18 years just because he dared to challenge Lukashenko. I will not uh, repeat my story because Professor Cooley uh, told uh, uh, you about this, but maybe uh, one thing was missed. After the fraudulent elections, um, dictator didn't accept the choice of Belarusian people. A few days, late, uh, a few days late, later after elections, KGB forced me to leave the country, but my exile didn't stop people from protesting against stolen elections. Hundreds of thousands took to the streets every weekend for four months. Workers were preparing for nationalized strike. Brave students like yourself were organizing pickets in front of their universities. It felt at that moment like the regime was about to collapse. And at this critical moment, Putin propped Lukashenko up, giving him money and promising military support. He even sent propagandists from Russia today because people were massively quitting their state television. The regime cracked down on my people with brutal violence. There are 1,340 political prisoners like my husband at the moment in our country. My husband, for example, has been locked up in punishment cell for months on the end without access to his lawyer, basic hygiene, warm clothing, and even a mattress. Right now, he is most likely sleeping, shivering on a rusty piece of metal meant to serve as his bed. Thousands of others are suffering the same. And some of them are those brave students who picketed in front of university gates. The regime's violence spread outside the borders. Last year, the dictator hijacked a European plane to arrest a journalist. Later, he organized an artificial border crisis. He brought thousands of people from Iraq and Lebanon to the border with Poland and Lithuania. It was disgusting and cruel to use innocent people in his political games. And finally, this year, dictator has enabled Putin's invasion of Ukraine to pay back for his support. That's why we need to act and act fast to stop this violence from spreading further. That's why I came here at the UN General Assembly. In the last two years, we managed to build up an international coalition in support of democratic Belarus. I was humbled to meet President Biden, Chancellor Merkel, and President Macron, and I got their full support. But words of support is not enough. We need actions. This morning, President Putin announced the military mobilization for war against Ukraine. It means thousands more victims of ambitious of tyrant. We must stay united to support Ukraine. The majority of Belarusians doesn't support the war. Hundreds of Belarusian volunteers are fighting there in Ukraine right now, alongside the Ukrainian army. Some of them participated in the recent successful offensive. Many sacrificed their lives. We know that the fate of Belarus is also decided on the battlefield of Ukraine. But we should realize that Ukraine can't be safe while bloody dictator nearby. Today, Belarus can be seen as part of problem when it comes to the war in Ukraine, but it can also be key to ending the war. Democratic Belarus will be the worst sanction against Putin, and it will be the best assistance to Ukraine. Therefore, when I speak to politicians, I always repeat, weaken the regime 
and strengthen the people. Remember, dictatorships seem to be stable until they are not. Everyone knows when things happen, they happen fast. During my meetings here in the UN with international leaders, I will ask them for bravery and decisiveness. This is exactly the moment when the democratic world must show its teeth. You know, sometimes I hear from foreign leaders the words, oh, we have done everything possible. So try to tell these words to mom of murdered activists or a six-year-old son of political prisoner. I'm sure there is still a lot of space to make a difference, and we just have to move on and never give up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Leader. I want to pick up on the news from this morning about announcing the general or partial general mobilization in Russia. And it raises the question about President Lukashenko's leadership uh, and Belarus's role in supporting uh, Vladimir Putin and the current invasion of Ukraine. We have seen Lukashenko amend the country's constitution um, February, just after the conflict broke out, to get rid of Belarus's neutral status and to also uh, lift the prohibition on the stationing of nuclear weapons um, in the country. And reports are that Belarus has also been used as a staging post, as a through post for many of the Russian troops that committed atrocities in Ukraine, including in Bucha. What is your view on how Belarus as a government and its armed forces should be held accountable for their role in supporting Russian forces in this horrific campaign against Ukraine? So first of all, uh, I would, to, would like to underline that the regime became collaborant in this war. Uh, Lukashenko became a puppet of Putin because uh, after elections 2020, Putin was, uh, mm, was backing up uh, Lukashenko's power. And uh, Lukashenko has to pay debts uh, for that support. Uh, Lukashenko became collaborant. He gave our land as a uh, launching pad for uh, Russian technique, for Russian equipment, for Russian troops to invade Ukraine from uh, northern border. But Belarusian people who had always wonderful relationship with the Ukrainians are against the war. And they showed uh, the anti-war uh, moods immediately when the war has started. Just imagine, since 2020, Belarusians live like in Gulag. Every day, people are detained for the uh, anti-regime moods. People in Belarus can be detained for the wrong color of socks or for the comments on internet. People are sentenced to years of prisons. Uh, people live in fear, but when the war, after the start of the war, um, people for the first time since 2020 went out to the streets to show that they are against the war. Of course, uh, Lukashenko again uh, started to detain people for the anti-war position already. So if before you where you were the enemy for Lukashenko if you were against the regime. So now you are an enemy because you are against the war. Thousands of people have been detained for the anti-war um, uh, anti comments, uh, anti-war uh, moods. So this is the, the uh, repressions continued. So what Lukashenko has done since the beginning of the war was against Belarusian people. And when the war has started, Belarusian partisans, despite of terror, despite of repressions, started uh, underground uh, resistance. They disrupted railways to stop Russian equipment going through our country to uh, invade Kyiv. About 80 acts of sabotage took place. Of course, uh, some partisans have been um, kidnapped 
Of course, they were put in jail, and now they can face death penalty for their actions. Ordinary Belarusians who also were scared by this regime, they took pictures of uh, Russian troops, of movement of Russian uh, technique or, or tanks across our country and sent this information to the Ukrainian army, for the Ukrainian army should, could be prepared for possible attacks from the uh, side of uh, Belarus. Also, hundreds of uh, Belarusian military volunteers joined uh, Ukrainian army and now fighting shoulder to shoulder with these uh, brave uh, people. So, Belarusian people uh, said uh, they showed uh, their eagerness to support Ukraine. So, and our army, actually, our army uh, also doesn't share uh, willingness of Lukashenko to participate in this war. Our army refused to uh, go and uh, fight alongside, uh, you know, Russian people. And uh, so, of course, Lukashenko has to be brought uh, to justice because of uh, this, this, his participation in this war. The same as he has to uh, feel accountability for human rights abuses, for tortures in our country, for migration crisis, for hijacking of uh, uh, this flight, and also for this attempt to deploy a nuclear um, weapon at our territory. Of course, we have to uh, bring all possible mechanisms uh, to avoid Lukashenko's impunity. You are, for all practical purposes now, a leader in exile, forced to live outside of your country. And indeed, the fate of so much of Belarus's brave civil society now is outside of the country, whether we think of its independent media, its uh, civic organizing, many of the leading thinkers. Um, and they interface with those brave enough to remain um, and protest. But it is an interesting dynamic. I'm curious, what are the most important strategies that you have to keep your work from outside relevant, to maintain contact and connection to the citizens that you represent as a democratic leader? So a lot of brave people, activists, journalists are now in jails. And of course, thousands of people had to flee Belarus because of repressions. All our alternative media in country have been ruined. Thousands of NGOs have been liquidated in Belarus. But we managed to, they managed to restore their activity in exile. And it's not, of course, true that, it's not truth that all active people uh, fled Belarus because on the streets were hundreds of thousands of people and about maybe one, uh, 100,000 only left Belarus. So most active people is still in our country. And of course, it's our main task to uh, be in contact, to um, keep this connection, to communicate with people, to understand uh, what are the uh, main concerns at the moment. And of course, it's much more uh, difficult to communicate when you are uh, abroad and people are inside, but thanks to technologies, ten thanks to, I don't know, Zoom conferences, it's still possible to uh, communicate with people. For example, every week I have so-called office hours when every person in Belarus or uh, from Belarus and diaspora abroad can call me and we can have short uh, inspiration dialogue, people asking questions, people share their ideas, and most of people are calling from Belarus. And I see uh, that despite of fear, despite of repressions, there is still energy of people, in people, uh, energy to continue this fight. People feel responsibility for those who sacrificed with their freedom, some with their lives, to give us opportunity to continue this fight. And uh, I have to say that for Belarusians who are in the country, it's very dangerous to communicate with me because I'm recognized as terrorist in uh, Belarus, the same as uh, journalists are recognized as extremists. You know, <laughs> thousands of people are, uh, you know, filled this list of terrorists uh, in, in Belarus. But uh, people know how to avoid these re restrictions. People know how to... Um, 
have access to alternative media without um, without the consequences for them. They're using VPN, they are uh, watching YouTube, they're using TikTok, you know, to, to know the truth about what's going on. So, and our task, of course, to, fee to keep people safe on the ground. All those active people who are ready to continue uh, this fight when the window of opportunity will appear, we have to keep them uh, in safety. So we are very cautious about communicating, but still we have opportunity to um, uh, have access you know, to, uh, you know, to the majority of Belarusians. You mentioned earlier on a related point, the, uh, the forced downing of Ryanair flight in May 2021 that was flying from Athens to Vilnius and flying over the airspace of Belarus, it was forced to land and journalist in exile, Roman Protasevich, was arrested on the spot. At the time, and it seems so long ago given all the horrors of the last month, but this was less than 18 months ago, mm -hmm. I think the whole world was in shock that we could have such a brazen act of piracy and terrorism between essentially two European and two NATO countries um, to down to arrest a third party on that flight. How did that affect the community in exile and diaspora? Did this signal that um, Lukashenko was uh, threatening you beyond his borders? What kind of reverberations did this incident have on your work? I think it showed to Belarusians not only in, in exile and in, in the diaspora, but also uh, to people uh, inside Belarus that to keep his power, Lukashenko's power, he doesn't have red lines. He's ready to abuse international laws, international uh, rights, you know, to um, like punish people who are against them. He's ready to hijack airplane. He's ready to uh, threaten our Western neighbors with uh, migrants. You know, he doesn't care about anything, only about his own power. So, of course, he showed to people abroad that he has long hands and he will not stop in front of anything to get us. And of course, all those who fled Belarus feel that uh, they are in danger all the time. But simultaneously, we understand that people who stay in Belarus are under even more danger. And uh, people who had, uh, who had to flee Belarus, they didn't return to their ordinary life. You know, they are not trying to organize, uh, you know, they further existence, you know, but, but they continue and they fight. And Lukashenko knows this. Two years passed, and Lukashenko still behaves as if hundreds of thousands of people in front of his palace. He's scared by people as well. He knows that he didn't manage to turn the, to turn the page. You know, he knows that people are still opposing. And if there is, as I said already, if only the window of opportunity for Belarus and people appear, there will be hundreds of thousands on the streets. He's very, he feels very fragile, he feels very insecure. That's why he is strengthening repressions. He, it's very important for him to show this cruelty towards people every day. So he has no uh, borders, you know. So as this crackdown continues, uh, the political opposition um, perhaps because of what is happening in Ukraine, um, by some has been characterized as increasingly fragmented and possibly divided. In August, you had a unity conference in Vilnius. Um, what do you see as the most pressing immediate priorities over the next few months in the political opposition movement? Um, what do you have to do, especially in this climate where the spotlight justifiably appears to be on what Ukraine is enduring and what they're doing. Um, how do you think about this moment in your campaign? I'm sorry for correcting you, but I just have to explain to the students that uh, we are not Belarusian opposition, because opposition is the party that is opposing to the ruling party. For you to understand, uh, Belarusian people is the new majority, I would say. 
It's Lukashenko with his small support is in opposition to Belarusian people. So we call ourselves democratic movement because we know that the majority of Belarusians are against uh, this regime. So because uh, sometimes people in democratic countries don't really understand the difference when you call us opposition, maybe we are a party or whatever. Uh, of course now, uh, the whole attention of the whole international attention uh, is on Ukraine. But we look, we are not competing for this attention. We know that now on the territory of Ukraine, the fate of democracy is being decided. You know, not only one country, but the whole democracy. And uh, our task now is on the one hand to support Ukraine and Ukrainians as much as we can in our circumstances in difficult position, but also uh, not to allow to overlook Belarus in this, um, uh, you know, in this crisis, because Belarus is part of our regional crisis. And this crisis can be solved only in complex, because while Lukashenko is in power and all this cruel machine is in power, there, there will be constant threat to Ukraine, to our Western neighbors. So we have to, as I said, you know, to solve this crisis in complex. And Ukrainians understand this as well. The fates of both our countries are interconnected because Putin doesn't consider no Ukraine, no Belarus as separate, independent, and sovereign countries. He thinks that we belong to his, uh, like, uh, Soviet empire. And that's why we have to fight for our independence, to fight for our uh, sovereignty, to fight for the very existence uh, of both our countries. So we have international attention. We have created the coalition of countries who are supporting us. Of course, uh, as I said in my speech, much more uh, can be done. Uh, but again, now we, um, our, as, I, as I said, our fate is connected, and connected with the fate of Ukraine. So it's very important not to uh, live like Belarus in shadow. So I'm gonna ask one more question and then we will go into the question and answer period. So I'll invite students now or participants, if you do have questions, to begin lining up at the microphones. So my final question is this. In 2016, President Lukashenko, commenting on the US presidential election, made a controversial comment saying, a woman still cannot become president of the United States. And then he emphasized that in Belarus, there are many talented women, but our society is not read, ready yet to elect a woman as president. You yourself, when you first stepped into this role, said that you were filling in as any wife, as any mother would have done. Yet, I think it's fair to say that two years later, you have emerged not just as a placeholder, but as a distinguished and inspirational leader for so many in your country and around the world. Could you reflect a little bit about your own journey these last two years? What lessons have you drawn about your leadership? What are the principles and values that guide you? Um, what advice do you have to other young women who would like to follow in your footsteps and be involved in political organizing? Uh, you know, I have never considered myself to be a leader. I was mother, I was wife, and uh, for example, in uh, mm, my family, because I had to take care about my uh, child with special needs, like my husband was engine of our, uh, of our family, and I was never supposed even to uh, be in politics. But what I have understood that when life put you in front of difficult choice, unexpected choice, uh, you are making this choice with, like make, it, make this choice easy because you understand what, that uh, this is the right path. It was extremely difficult 
uh, at the beginning of my so-called political career. When you have never, the same as millions of Belarusians, have never uh, been interested in politics. You don't know how this uh, political world work. Uh, you don't know the institutions. You don't know what's the difference be between Council of Europe and European Council. You don't know uh, almost uh, anything about uh, UN structure. And you have to study every day. You don't know politicians. You don't know uh, how protocol work. But I think that I have, I had and have the best teachers ever. I had presidents, prime ministers, ministers, politicians uh, as my teachers. I haven't been studying in university as you do. Uh, life taught me. And uh, it was extremely difficult. I had my team around me. I had millions of Belarusians who have been supporting me. They believed in me, they trusted me and continue to believe and trust. And I took res this responsibility on myself to be the voice of Belarusians on the uh, political arena. And I realized that without people, I wouldn't be able to go through this difficult path. So, so I'm so grateful to all Belarusians who are supporting me, who are continuing to inspire me as well. They, they fight the small steps inside Belarus, big steps outside Belarus, uh, give me energy to continue. And of course, I every day feel this pain for political prisoners, for my husband. I see my children growing up for two years already without their daddy, and I realize that there are thousands of families who whose parents, whose uh, uh, fathers are in jail, and they can't stop, and I can't stop. So I'm continuing to study, I'm continuing to uh, learn from, uh, from this life, and actually um, there were a couple of disappointments maybe, you know, when I was sure that such, for example, organizations as uh, UN could easily stop terror, in Belarus, they could easily uh, defeat Lukashenko's regime, seeing what atrocities are going on in Belarus, and couldn't. We saw a like, couple of organizations who could be mediators uh, between regime and uh, democratic forces, and they also like couldn't do a lot. A lot of organizations who have to deal with uh, tortures, with human rights abuses. For example, they can't have access to Belarusian jails to see in what awful um, conditions uh, political prisoners. But maybe our task as Belarusians, you know, to uh, show maybe unconventional ways to politicians to structures, you know, how to gain some successes, you know, in their in the actions, because non-conventional times need non-conventional decisions. And actually, we have already made some unprecedented steps uh, in our activity. And I think that Belarusian question managed to unite uh, at least European countries with the USA, Canada, and this, those countries have been like prepared in the unity for a strong response on Ukrainian events. I think we did a lot. I did a lot. Belarusian people did a lot. And of course, international community uh, did a lot for our country. But it's still a long path ahead of us. And only uh, decisiveness, only unity will help us to and with Lukashenko's regime to end the war in Ukraine and to show that democracy has teeth. Thank you. So let's move on to the Q&A. So I'll begin over here. Just a reminder, please introduce yourself. Give us your name, your school. Um, please do ask a question, not a long statement. 
um, be as succinct as possible. And just a reminder, we are very much on the record and also being recorded. Please. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Madam Leader. Uh, my name is Matthew Meltzer. I'm a law student here at the university. First of all, thank you for being here today and speaking with us. Uh, I was wondering, in your perspective, looking forward, do you see a possibility of a peaceful turnover of power in Belarus, or do you think that regime change will, by necessity, have to be done using force? So since the beginning of our revolution, we declared that we want our changes to happen peacefully. We don't want any to be, to be guilty uh, in any uh, violence, in any possible victims. And of course, we see the changes through diplomacy, through peaceful means, through international organizations. Uh, a lot has changed when the war started and uh, we hear more and more voices from Belarus that we have to be uh, more, um, Uh, radical, I don't want to use this word, but I still insist that, look, uh, changes through peaceful means are more sustainable. And alongside with the pressure, with multiple points of pressure on the regime, we create democratic institutions. We teach our people who forgot what it means to live under democracy, how democracy works, you know. And we don't want our fight to be only because of the sense of, uh, the feeling of revenge to this regime. We want to ch change like people's minds, you know. We open, uh, we study them how democracies in different countries work, that democracy is responsibility. And uh, it's a difficult process, but I think that taking participation through what our people are going through, uh, it will be very easy for people to um, gain these new rules of democracy and people will cherish the democracy of uh, our future. Better. So still, I, st I still insist on uh, uh, peaceful uh, democratization of Belarus. Thank you for that. Let's take the next question. Hello, uh, my name is Ifrat, I'm from Israel. I'm a grad student at the, um, the Graduate School of Arts and Science. Uh, my question to you is, we've seen what had happened to people who dare to oppose tyrants as um, what had happened to uh, Navalny in Russia. Uh, my question to you is, except for being in exile, you're walking as a free person in the world, um, aren't you afraid of being hurt, or how do you keep yourself safe? As I said before, we don't know how long uh, regime hands are. And we also understand that not only like Belarusian KGB people are working, uh, we are uh, n extremely non comfortable also for uh, Russian uh, propaganda, for Russian KGB as well. But for two years, you already got used to this feeling of constant uh, threat, that you got used to live with this, because you understand that uh, you can be, you, you can be uh, a target, but you know that hundreds of thousands are under the target, those who are in Belarus under the target, and you just forget about this. If not you, uh, another person will take, uh, you know, your place. Of course, uh, you know, you don't want to uh, be jailed or die, you know, look, you don't want even to think about this. Uh, but uh, it's like, you understand that you have to sacrifice with something, and uh, you just go forward not thinking about this. If you think about uh, threats to your life constantly, you just will uh, go mad. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's take the next question over here, please. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Hugo Matusik. I'm from the Czech Republic. Uh, I would like to thank you for all you do. I think it's extremely important, not for just Belarus, but also for all of Europe. Um, you mentioned several times that the situation in Ukraine and Belarus is very much connected and even connected with Vladimir Putin. Do you believe that it's possible uh, for, you know, to be there free Belarus 
or Ukraine, free Ukraine for that matter, with Vladimir Putin in power in Russia? Thank you. Uh, thank you. First of all, I have to say that uh, Václav Havel was a fan of Belarus. He was very supportive to our country through all his uh, ruling. Uh, actually, our future, future of both our countries, shouldn't depend uh, on the uh, on decisions of one crazy person. But I think that Russian people also understand that policy of uh, Putin is uh, leading them to uh, to like. Uh, time of Iron Curtain, and they will, they have to oppose to this. So everything is changing. And uh, of course, uh, you know, Putin now, you know, all these years Putin seemed to be so a strong leader, so strong person, strong army. But this war in Ukraine uh, showed that the king is naked that it's possible to defeat uh, such like so-called huge empire. So uh, I think that uh, democratic countries, Belarusian people, Ukrainians showed that it's possible to defend their lands, to defend their uh, sovereignty, to, to at least fight for it uh, while uh, Vladimir Putin is there. So uh, it's important to show to this person that yes, it's absolutely possible to gain independence, to uh, gain peace in the country when he is still there. But of course, he has to uh, bear the full responsibility for what uh, this person and his government and the Russian govern so-called government has done to Ukrainians. Thank you. Thank you. Question here. Hi, hello. Uh, my name is Yuri. I'm actually from Israel. I was born in Russia, but uh, and I actually work here as an engineer. Um, I have a question to continue, a Frat's question about Navalny. So I wonder if you ever spoke with his wife or why she didn't actually did what you do. And uh, I wish you most of luck and persistence, and I hope you succeed. Thank you. Uh, you know, we always um, were watching closely uh, on actions of Russian opposition, and uh, but I have never met with uh, no Navalny, no his wife, because both our countries have um, different paths. If in 2020 Belarusians showed their majority confronting Lukashenko. Uh, in Russia, there are like, uh, you know, n not huge opposition uh, movements or parties or whatever. Of course, Navalny is a huge like leader. He's an uh, example for, uh, for Russian people how they uh, should um, uh, fight with the regime. But we have different context. And actually, uh, in 2020, we our fight was internal fight, and we, it didn't have any like geopolitical character. And we didn't want like to be connected with uh, Russian uh, like opposition to show that we are not fighting against Putin or against Russia. It was, was our internal affair. Uh, I know that people from uh, Belarusian Democratic Forces are communicating with the uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, I don't know, democratic leaders who are in exile, you know, maybe they uh, share opinions, share experience, uh, but again, the context is different, and especially now when the war in Ukraine has started, and, uh, uh, you know, I would say that huge number, maybe majority of Russians, uh, at least publicly, um, supporting this war. I also understand that there is a feeling of fear among Russians, uh, but, uh, Still, we, uh, we like, uh, would like to see more, uh, to hear more voices, until voices from, from uh, Russia. But still, we are supporting all those brave people who are uh, fighting uh, by their means with, uh, with Putin's regime. Thank you. Next question from over here. 
I'd like uh, first like to thank you for coming and speaking with all of us. I know we greatly appreciate it. Um, so my question uh, touches upon what you touched upon. Just tell us who you are. Oh, Sorry, apologies. Just, thank you. Yeah. My name is Mitchell. I'm at the European Institute studying a master's in European history and politics. Thank you. Sorry. Um, my question touches upon how you mentioned Western leaders have supported uh, or mentioned their support for your movement, democratic movement in Belarus against the regime. To what extent uh, are you hoping that their policies go to help the democratic movement and what specific policies are you looking to see from Western leaders such as President Biden, President Macron and also uh, mm -hmm. the German Chancellor? So when uh, fraudulent elections took place in Belarus, it was important for us that Lukashenko wasn't recognized as uh, president anymore uh, in international society. And the strongest uh, countries, uh, democratic countries supported this. They denied that Lukashenko is a uh, legal or legitimate president of Belarus. They recognized me, they recognized Belarusian society. It was very, very important step because Belarusians felt that they are not abandoned, that they are not one-on-one uh, -on -one with the uh, fight. And uh, I was uh, accepted uh, uh, by, uh, I, I had a lot of meetings uh, in 2020 with uh, uh, a lot of uh, you know, politicians and leaders. And it was clear signal to the regime that alternative voice is heard, that we are not going to communicate with you, representatives of the regime anymore, because there are people who obviously uh, are for democratic changes in, the, in, in, in your country. We asked for political and economical pressure on the regime. And uh, the first sanctions have been imposed on Lukashenko's regime were for human rights abuses in Belarus. The next one were for um, hijacking of this aircraft, for migration crisis, for, for participation in the war. But it was very important that on the one hand, um, leaders, politicians, they create pressure uh, on the regime, on the state uh, enterprises, on the government, on uh, cronies of uh, Lukashenko, but on the other hand, they support uh, people of Belarus. We uh, uh, got assistance uh, from uh, democratic countries to support civil society, to support our culture, to support our media, because um, uh, Belarus became you know, very important in, 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 uh, in the region, and uh, Belarusians always declared that we have the same values as uh, democratic countries have. And uh, it was very important for the leaders to show that they are standing on the side uh, of democracy. And um, this support is, is being continued and uh, um, still nobody uh, recognizes Lukashenko, nobody is, is uh, talking to uh, him and this consistency is very important because in our history, uh, in the history of uh, Belarus, there were uh, several times uh, that uh, after fraudulent elections Lukashenko took political prisoners as hostages and started to trade with them. Sanctions have been imposed but Lukashenko, you know, uh, released political prisoners in exchange of lifting of sanctions. And we don't want this to repeat it uh, again. Our uh, people who are in jails now, they don't want to be bargaining chips. And uh, now we insist on this policy. Don't trade with political prisoners. Create as much possible political economical pressure on the regime as possible, but not trade. Don't uh, go back you know, to the mistakes that have been done many times before. So, uh, yeah, I just, maybe I have answered your question. So, democratic world with uh, us, but uh, maybe uh, sometimes the words of condemn, condemnation uh, are not enough. Uh, we would like to see more uh, actions more decisiveness, but uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult in the political world. Yeah. Please. 
my name is Zinaida Osipova. I'm originally from Russia, and I'm a PhD student in the history department here at Columbia. And my question actually is very related to the previous one, uh, so I will uh, amend it a bit. So my question is, uh, again, related to the fact that you said in your introduction that you want more concrete actions rather than words. So my question is, uh, to whom this is directed? What kind of support do you feel that the Belarusian people need? And also, uh, what role do you think, um, for example, states outside of the West could play in this? Do you see any role that they might play? And to what extent do you want external forces to be involved in the process? So uh, maybe let's start with uh, UN, so as we hear on the UN General Assembly and uh, uh, hundreds of countries, you know, are included into this organization, so every country can have its voice. So first of all, we uh, need more attention. And uh, for example, UN uh, Security Council can have um, hearing on Belarus. It would be also unprecedented. I know that Russia has uh, veto right and they would never allow this, but there are uh, side events or uh, there could be ways how to circumvent uh, this uh, veto, you know, to uh, put Belarus high on agenda. Uh, also, you and generally, uh, General Assembly can um, have specific like a resolution on Belarus. It also uh, would be a huge signal to Belarusian government that Belarus is high on agenda, Belarus is straight, is straight and Belarus is not uh, forgotten. Uh, also, it's in uh, uh, sometimes I forget English words. <laughs> Uh, UN Security Council can uh, have mechanisms to um, drag Lukashenko uh, to responsibility for, for his crimes. I already uh, uh, mentioned his, his crimes about nuclear, about human rights abuses, about tortures. So more actions could be done in this direction. I understand also that there are so many uh, difficult issues around the world, and Belarus is one of the issues, but uh, I actually suppose that, uh, you know, much, much more can be done in this direction. Uh, International Court of Justice uh, could uh, launch proceedings against Lukashenko. Uh, for Ryan, for Ryan Hajek and for migration, violation of uh, uh, convention against torture and so on. Of course, we are not talking now about tribunal, but start this work of collecting evidences of investigation can already be done. Uh, it's difficult, we understand this. A lot of uh, um, uh, people, maybe money could be spent on this, but it's like clear uh, actions that uh, can be done. Again, every country on national level, on the level of European Union, in the USA, uh, can support uh, civil society. Uh, we are in difficult situation. We need more uh, assistance. Uh, our families of political prisoners need assistance. Just, okay, an example. Some people are being released at the moment who already um, uh, end their two years uh, sentence, for example people go out in extremely poor physical and moral state. And we are asking for government, create rehabilitation programs for those people. Rehabilitation programs for children of uh, political prisoners. Just take, I don't know, uh, organize 10, 20 uh, places somewhere in, uh, in, in sanatorium or uh, whatever, you know, to, for people could recover from the awful two years or two and a half years in jail. You can't even imagine in what state people live, live uh, uh, jail. Or um, host uh, our people of culture. You know, people of culture had to flee Belarus because of repressions, and they need to create, they need to write books, they need to paint, and, uh, you know, they, they, they can't earn a lot of money with, with this uh, activity, so uh, uh, give him, I don't know, grants or a place to live uh, where they can create. There are 
th hundreds and hundreds of uh, cases. Okay, we are in the university now. So we have a lot of students in jails. Now you can not to wait until these students are released, because for example, we have famous, uh, famous student, Artyom Bayatsky, who wants to be a uh, medical chemist, medical chemist, can I say so? And now he was jailed for five years in jail because he was opposing this regime. So you can in advance um, propose him the place in any un university. Just when you are released, you will have right to study in our university. It will be huge honor for him and uh, not maybe big deal for you, but it will be very important for this for this person. On, on um, level of university, on, on level of uh, government, on level of uh, uh, organization, a lot can be done. We send uh, our proposal uh, frequently, uh, systematically, you know, to different organizations, and they know what, what can be done. But uh, there should be political will, there should be eagerness to stand with Belarusian people in their fight, to stand with Ukrainians the same. And uh, so we are working a lot hard, you know, to, um, uh, you know, to promote our values, to promote our fight. We are Thank almost you. at time, but we have time for one more quick question. So please, this will be the final one. Thank you, Svetlana, for your talk. Uh, my name is uh, Ruslan Polovinko. Uh, I'm from Graduate School of Arts and Science. And my question is about Belarusian uh, Shadow Cabinet. So what are the updates of their actions and uh, future plans? So thank you. On uh, the 9th of August 2022, we decided to organize a United Transitional Cabinet. The uh, main aim of uh, this cabinet is to uh, fight for uh, independence and sovereignty of Belarus and to uh, uh, be executive uh, body now and when there will be changes uh, on this transition period in Belarus. So already we have six, six representatives uh, in, this, uh, um, uh, in this cabinet. And uh, first of all, we show in our unity that people are working together. Uh, this cabinet was very well percepted in Belarus and uh, on international arena because it shows that we are working together. So now uh, this cabinet is still on the stage of forming, uh, but people are communicating every day. And uh, uh, today, I suppose, while I'm here, the, um, uh, yeah, there was reaction from the cabinet on this um, uh, military mobilization uh, in Russia. You know, we have to prepare documents showing that uh, we are working, but it will be like executive body and we can't show like uh, achievements now. It's already, one, uh, it's only one month old, uh, but but uh, the, work in, the work is going on and our task is to attract as much, as many people as possible in our structures. And Coordination Council, if you are in, in our topic, Coordination Council is also being reformed to be, um, uh, to be like proto-parliament, you know, to uh, propose what can be done, you know, to, uh, to be uh, maybe to restrict some activity of, of, uh, uh, of this executive body. So we are building a prototype of uh, democratic government. You know, when the time comes, we just could take it from exile and put it uh, in Belarus, you know, not to have this uh, political gap uh, in, in Belarus when time comes. Thank you. Madam Tikhonovska, you've covered so much ground about the region, about Belarus, also your personal experiences. Uh, thank you for thank visiting you. us. It's a great pleasure thank and an you. honor.